Today is the ninth Sunday after Pentecost. The epistle is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Catholics in Corinth, chapter 10. Brethren, let us not covet evil things, as they also coveted. Neither become idolaters, as some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them that committed fornication, and there fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them tempted him and perished by the serpents. Neither do you murmur, as some of them murmured and were destroyed by the exterminator. Now all these things happen to them in figure, and they are written for our correction, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore he that thinketh himself to stand, let him take heed lest he fall. Let no temptation take hold on you, but such as is human. And God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will make also with temptation issue, that you may be able to bear it. The Holy Gospel. Taken from St. Luke, chapter 19. At that time when Jesus drew near to Jerusalem, seeing the city, he wept over it, saying, If thou also had made known, had known, and that in this thy day the things that are to thy peace, but now they are hidden, hidden from thy eyes. For the day shall come upon thee, and thy enemy shall cast a trench around thee, and encompass thee around, and straighten thee on every side, and beat thee flat to the ground. And thy children who are in thee, and they shall not leave in thee a stone upon a stone, because thou hast not known the time of thy visitation. And entering into the, into the temple, he began to cast out them that sold therein, and, and them that bought, saying to them, It is written, My house is the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And he was teaching daily in the temple. Thus are the words of the sacred scripture. Trust me, Christine. So this last Thursday, Father Pfeiffer and I had the chance to go and uh, visit Bishop Tissi de Mallory in Chicago, and uh, he received us very cordially, very kindly, very hospitably as, as a brother of Society of St. Pius X priest, and he being a bishop received us uh, most cordially. We talked for about two hours and um, I wish I could say with, with glowing colors that it was great, it went well and he's, he's you know, fighting and going to uh, condemn the errors that are infiltrating into the Society of Pius X and so forth. I wish I could say that but um, truthfully, we didn't. He didn't. He didn't leave us with any real conclusion. And uh, all I can say is, pray for him. He is a bishop of the Catholic Church, and he has a duty to speak out when no bishops are speaking out to defend the Catholic faith. When the Catholic faith is being attacked not only from the enemies outside, but the enemies from within, and now within the bastion of Catholic tradition, the enemies are working hard to water down all opposition. And uh, so after the Mass, I, I will give a more thorough catechism on the, the new declaration of June 27th by the three bishops. And uh, We'll cover that, cover some ground on that. It's very important you be aware 
of the new stage of battle that we are in. Um, one of the principles of warfare of an enemy, the enemy is best when he is not known and seen. That's the best enemy. And uh, we'll cover that in the catechism after the mass during the, uh, the refreshments. Today, Father Pfeiffer is in Ireland, and uh, hopefully he'll be meeting with another priest, Father Jackman, who is uh, uh, from Flanders, a very good older priest of the society. He's very interested to help us in the resistance to, uh, to preserve what the Archbishop wanted his society to do. So uh, I ask you to pray for him and all the other good priests who um, hopefully will come and help. Just in case you think, think things are really the same and things are um, as they always were, that's simply not true. What you see happening now in the most recent transfers all throughout the world, uh, Father Peter Scott and Kimball are going as a punishment to preach to the bamboos, uh, the baboons rather, and the bamboos in Africa. And uh, Father Beauvais in in St. Nicolas de Chardonnay in Paris, that was a, it's the biggest parish in Europe. Um, he was he was the one that led the processions of the Rosary against the theater about two years ago. There was a theater going throughout Europe and played in Paris, which was a mockery of Jesus Christ, the King, uh, showing uh, it was a horrible play, showing excrement coming out of the eyes of our Lord on a huge face of our Lord on the background, just a horrible blasphemous play, and uh, it was our youth that got up on stage and locked arms and prayed the rosary, and they blocked the, the continuation of this play, and they tried to drag them off the stage, and they went to their knees and continued praying the rosary, and outside the, the police had to use tear gas, and they were trying to ship out by bus forcing them all to, taking them all to jail, but they can't take thousands and thousands to jail. So it is thanks to Father Beauvais who led that. And he also led most recently, he was the priest that led the rosary procession against the uh, terrible Sodom and Gomorrah laws that were just passed in France and also were just passed here in the United States to the to the shame of our leaders, and uh, fasten your seatbelts, because once these laws are passed, and these vices are glorified, it's not long between that and the fires coming down from heaven to destroy. And the Virgin Mary did foretell this in Fatima. She foretold in Akita, fire will come down from heaven to destroy over a third of the human race sparing neither laity or priests, the good or the bad. And God is very patient, he's very kind, he's very merciful, but once man starts mocking God, by mocking his commandments, and mocking his laws, and mocking his, his truths. Uh, the mother of God did say in Garbandal, I'm trying to hold back my, my son's arm, but I, the cup is filling up and it's already filling over, spilling over. And I cannot hold back the arm of my son forever. The justice of God, when it unleashes, watch out. Um, just a little example, uh, the, the, um, in Japan in the 1600s, the, the persecution of the priests were very cruel. And they put to death many priests. And they mocked the baptismal rites. They mocked the sacraments. They not only put the priest to death, but they mocked Christ, the King. And one of the last priests to be martyred said, Nagasaki will be punished. And Nagasaki, as you know, was, was burnt up. And not that it was right for the Allies to drop the bomb, and they'll answer to God for that. Uh, however, Nagasaki did, it was the fulfillment of a punishment that was foretold. 
So, as you know, what happened, and uh, I mean, everything was burnt up. Uh, people, uh, uh, over, I don't know how many billions of people were just burnt to a crisp, just like that. And uh, that's one of the greatest punishments of God, sudden death. You see the people that know where they are, the flood, they had some time to make an act of contrition while the water was going higher and higher. But to be taken by a sudden death is one of the greatest punishments. Um, and that's why in the Litany of the Saints it says, from a sudden and unprovided death, deliver us, O Lord. So we always want to be ready to die. We always want to be ready for living in the state of grace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. This Mass we contemplate our Lord Jesus Christ. He is weeping over Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the city of peace, who did not know its time of visitation. And as you know, speaking of punishments from God, for the deicide, for killing God, Jerusalem was punished. Seven, in the year 70 AD, the Roman armies came, surrounded it, and ransacked. And even um, Titus and Vespasian, who were the Romans in charge of this, this mission, they said there was something beyond human destroying this city with us. It was obviously the anger of God striking the city of Jerusalem. And so not a stone upon a stone, and uh, it was a, a, a terrible scourge. So <coughs> our Lord goes into the temple also, and he overturns the tables. He makes waves. Here the most prudent of prudence <laughs> comes and overturns their tables. The most gentlest of lambs, the meekest of all the meek and humble, Christ defends the honor of God the Father. He defends the honor of the, of the truth, and he overturns the tables and causes a huge ruckus. Even the Roman, Roman soldiers don't dare to approach him and tackle him as a fanatic, causing trouble. No, because he has the authority of God behind him, he being God himself. So our Lord, how he weeps over the city, the city of a nation, the city of his whole Catholic Church, which is falling to pieces now, but will not be destroyed. The gates of hell will not prevail. But we do, we shouldn't be too surprised because Our Lady did foretell us that Rome will lose the faith. Rome will become the seat of the Antichrist. The darkness that will, will uh, permeate all throughout the entire globe, the darkness of liberalism, atheism, communism, and godless, godlessnessism. And uh, that is, in other words, naturalism. One of the great Masonic sins of the modern world uh, is naturalism. And naturalism, what is it? Naturalism is the idea that the supernatural order doesn't exist, so we can just live like happy human beings on this earth, or as the evolutionists say, we're just another species to share the earth with other species of the planet. So we're just another, another species, which is an insult to Almighty God. So naturalism permeates even traditional Catholics, permeates even many, many people striving for sanctity. Why? Because naturalism denies the supernatural order and it denies original sin. And the supernatural order is above us, and we must live that life of the supernatural life to save our soul. And that is to believe all the truths that God has revealed. That's, the naturalism denies that. Freemasonry, which is the mother of naturalism, uh, among many of its ugly daughters, naturalism kills the supernatural spirit. And it also says, uh, you know, women can dress as they want, no matter how hot it is. No fat, no modesty, no purity, because, well, that's God made, you know, well, they don't say God made it. 
That's how we're, the human nature is. We gotta just live, live and let live. Live and let live. Just do as you want. And that no restraint, no penance, no self-sacrifice, no self-denial. And that's, that's naturalism. It's very, very subtle and very insidious. And it permeates the modern world today, all over. So, the, and then there is a temple that God really wants. The Old Testament temple was destroyed. The New Testament temples, that is the Catholic churches, that were built over centuries and centuries of the spreading of the Catholic faith. Even in the United States, with the missionaries here for over 200 years, you have incredible churches that have been built. Beautiful churches built by the Polish, the Ukrainian, the Germans, the, all throughout the whole United States and throughout the world. But after Vatican II, what happened to these churches? What happened to these churches? I know one altar boys, one group of altar boys, they were told Sunday, one of the Sundays after Mass, come tomorrow boys, uh, we're going to take down the altar. <coughs> and uh, when they came, they were given sledgehammers, axes, and uh, hammers to break down the marble altar. And most of the churches, they just bulldozed the altars of stone, smashed down the communion rails. And uh, all this for the establishment of the new religion that was instituted by Vatican II. The vision of Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich, she said, I see in the future a human church being built. And God did not bless this church. It was built with, by human beings with the help of the devils. And no angels assisted in building this church, she said. And I see the procession of bishops. They are like, uh, some of them have no heads. Some of them are cross-eyed. Some of them have crooked faces and noses. Some of them are all twisted and ugly looking. And these are the bishops of the Catholic Church who have lost the faith. And this is, the, this is Vatican II Church. And what in the world do the as superiors of society St. Pius X want to make an agreement with, a deal with, and be recognized by these criminals who mock and despise Jesus Christ the King? So there is also the, the, these temples of God, the Catholic churches, have been smashed and bulldozed. But there is God can even take that. He can even take the destruction of his temples. But there's one temple that he does not want destroyed. There's one temple that he, that he treasures most. And that is, as St. Paul says, don't you know that you are temples of the Holy Ghost? And that the, the Holy Ghost dwells in you. That means our body and our soul are walking chalices, walking tabernacles, walking temples. And that's why your, the temple of your church, of your body and soul, were consecrated at your baptism by the sacred oils. Just like a church, when it's consecrated, the altar is consecrated with oil. The church is completely marked and uh, exercised in the whole space of that church. It's consecrated to God. And that's why at your baptism, and all our baptisms, you were consecrated to God. And there was set up in your soul an altar. And that altar is your heart to offer the sacrifices of adoration, thanksgiving, petition, and reparation to God. And then also in your mind, you have the incense. The incense in your mind. What is that? The good thoughts of affection, adoration towards God. And God values one act of love for Him. He values one drop of act of love for Him from us more than the universe, as St. Thomas. Just to say to God, my God, I love you. Help me love you more. That is more pleasing to God than all the universe put together. One act of a rational creature adoring God. Especially today when most men ignore Him. 
and Dolly Milone. So he values this more than anything. And uh, so your body and your soul are consecrated. That is why, for example, the Catholic Church has always condemned cremation. Yes, because heretics said, well, the body won't rise again from the dead. That's why they burnt the bodies. But one of the main reasons is because your body is a temple of the Blessed Trinity. And it has to be buried with respect, and not just burned like pagans. The only exception for burning is when there's a disease, plague, or warfare. And even if you have an amputation of an arm or a leg, you're not allowed to just burn it. The teaching of the church is you have to bury it. Why? Because it, it's part of the body of, of the living temple of the Blessed Trinity. So your body is a, is a temple of God. That he does not want destroyed. He does not want that destroyed. So what will bulldoze the altar of your soul? What will smash the consecration of God from our soul, what is it? Mortal sin. Mortal sin will do it. If one mortal sin, as uh, the saints all tell us and the church teaches, one mortal sin is so serious that not even all the eternally, eternity of hellfire, with all its torments and its stench and its uh, being unable to move and being cooked alive forever, that is not enough even to sufficiently punish one mortal sin. That's how serious one mortal sin is against Almighty God. And it shows us also how merciful God is to give confession, to give His mercy. When any soul is sorry, He will forgive them. A contrite and humble heart, O God, you will not despise. So a soul can recover the consecration to God by a good confession. And the blood of Jesus washes the soul and gives back to that soul all the merits that that soul may have lost. So, the temple of the Holy Ghost is what we're supposed to live as. And uh, that is the altar, that is the temple God doesn't want destroyed. But the only way we can destroy it is by willingly accepting mortal sin. So let us turn to the Mother of God. She is the most beautiful temple. She never offended God at all. She was conceived without original sin. And that's why God chose her to be the cathedral where he would be ordained a priest. When was Jesus ordained a priest? It was when he was conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary. She is the first cathedral of the priest. And every priest ordained shares, participates in a quasi-hypostatic union, says St. Thomas Aquinas, in the priesthood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so Mary is, is the most perfect temple, never stained by sin. So let us consecrate ourselves to her, under her protection, to battle. And let us... Uh, let me remind you of the great words of Archbishop Lefebvre. I think that if I say these things to you, and here he was just talking about how we must resist the, the liberal invasion within the Catholic Church and in society, and also fight against the one world government, the one world religion that's being established now. And this Pope is promoting it. <laughs> this Pope is promoting it in a big way, a one world religion. Uh, I was told recently that in, in the fall he's going to call for the reconciliation of all the world religions, which is the, the religion of the Antichrist. So the Archbishop, <clears throat> seeing this already, he said, I think that if I say these things to you, it is to put our own fight <clears throat> in its historical context. It did not begin with Vatican II, obviously. It goes much farther back. It is a tough fight, very painful. Blood has flowed in this fight. And think of the martyrs of the Vendée, the martyrs in Flanders, the martyrs uh, under the Protestants in Ireland and, and Scotland and England. Think of the martyrs of the, 
of the French Revolution, the martyrs of the communists take over. All the, just for example, just in Ukraine, just one country, Stalin blocked the borders off in 1932 to 33. The New York Times, uh, Durant, I think this was his name, came to see, and he wrote in the New York Times, uh, Ukraine and Russia are prospering under communism. When at the very same time they were starving out over 17 million Catholic people in one winter. There was no leaves on the trees, no more dogs in the streets. Everything had been eaten. So when he says blood has flowed in this fight, that means all the martyrs, all those who died under persecution for the faith. And then the persecutions, separation of church and state, religious and nuns driven into exile. Remember in Spain, during the communists take, tried, they tried to take over in Spain, and the United States sent the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. Did you know that? The Abraham Lincoln Brigade to go help the communists crush the Catholic Church in Spain. And they took the nuns, drove them out of their convents, Carmelite nuns, stripped them, made them run down the street, laughing at them, shooting them at them as targets. And then they undug all the cemeteries and exposed the, the skeletons of the bodies of the nuns to mock them. Religious priests and monks and nuns driven into exile. And this is why, because of liberalism, which has invaded Vatican II and is invading the society of Pius X, it's the same principles. This is what we got to understand. This is what Archbishop Lefebvre wanted to deeply impress upon us. <clears throat> he said, it's the greatest danger threatening our faithful to put ourselves under conciliar Rome. And, and, and this is why it's so serious, because now... St. Peter's, the Redemptorists, the Good Shepherd Institute, all these con traditional communities, La Beru and Campos, they all first made an agreement with Rome, then they swallowed the poison. Then they became more silent against the errors. Then they started accepting the new masses legitimate and so forth and so forth. But what happened in the last year? Last July 14th, there was no agreement on paper. But the liberal ideas were already swallowed. The poison was swallowed before the agreement. Do you, do you see the, what has happened? Well, obviously you see, that's why you're here. But the poison, the, the poison of the agreement was swallowed before the agreement was signed. And this is why it's so deceptive, so diabolic, what is happening in the society. The, uh, the last bastion of tradition the enemies of Jesus Christ, they, they knew they, 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 the way to bring about its collapse and its division had to be accomplished, and it couldn't be accomplished in a better way by the enemies of Christ. Uh, and all the monks driven out. I remember in northern Spain, a whole monastery of monks were shot one by one. The, the stealing of the church property in France, for example, and so on. And not only in France, but also in Switzerland, in Germany, and Italy. The occupation of the pontifical states, driven, driving the Pope, that was Pius IX, back into the Vatican, where he had to flee for his life, Pius IX. Well, are we, with all these innovators, and against the doctrine professed by the traditional popes, Against their voice, raised in protest to defend the church's rights, our Lord's rights, to defend souls, whose side are we on? He's saying, whose side are we on? Are we going to go with the revolution and the conciliar church with all the liberalism? Or are we going to stay on the side of the saints, of the line of the traditional popes, of what the Catholic Church has always taught, no matter how persecuted we may be? I think we are truly a strength and a base to stand on which, which, which do not come from us, and that is what is good.
It is not our fight. It is our Lord's fight, which the church has carried on. So we cannot waver. Either we are for the church or we are against the Catholic Church. And for the, for the new conciliar church, which has nothing to do with the, the Catholic Church, or less and less to do with it. For when the Pope used to speak about the rights of man to begin with, he always used to allude also to the duties of men, but this no longer, no longer. The rights of man and this insistence on everything for man, everything by man, this is truly appalling. So our battle is laid out for us, dear faithful. And that is, we must never compromise the Catholic faith. And we must always resist what will make us lose the faith. And, I, and we have seen it over and over again. Once you start swallowing Vatican II, even one drop of it, you start losing your faith. And the proof is, look at all the priests who have accepted Vatican II. They have all, all in some way lost the faith and faithful especially. So we have to fight. We have no choice. And we must... Uh, uh, let me just close with the great words of Louis Voyot. These are powerful words, and they're beautiful. Louis Voyot was contemporary with Pius IX, and he was part of the anti-liberal uh, movement resistance. Let us expect the worst. <laughs> Let us concede that this irreligious flood has all the strength it boasts to have. We will crush the Catholic Church. That's what they boasted. And uh, if I might add also, um, St. Maximilian Kolbe, he saw the processions in Rome. This is what inspired him to form an army for Our Lady. They were having banners, the atheists were having banners, with, with uh, Satan over St. Michael, crushing St. Michael. And if you followed recently the, the Pope, Pope Francis and Benedict XVI, both of them present, blessed a hideous statue of St. Michael in Rome, in the Vatican Gardens, showing us a, a, a naked angel, mostly naked, over another angel. And the angel on the ground, is his armor has been torn off. And who's the one always armed with the armor of God? St. Michael. And this statue literally shows Satan over St. Michael. Blessed by the poet. All right. This secularist flood will overcome us. Just look at our newspapers, look at our schools, look at the whole naturalism that permeates everywhere. All right, it's going gonna, it's gonna to flood around us. What can we do? Nothing else. It doesn't matter, provided that this flood does not overcome the truth. The truth. We will be overcome, but we will, but we will leave the truth behind us as it was left by those who were overcome before us. In spite of this flood, we hold it, we embrace it, this truth, always new. As our parents have kept it, we will also keep it, for the generation is still to be born. The world still has a future, or it does not. If we are touching to the end of times, we are building for our eternity. That's why we have to fight on for heaven. But if there are still long centuries to come, building for eternity, we will also have built for these cen those centuries to come. Confronted with iron, that is bullets or swords or concentration camps, confronted with iron or with contempt, we must be the firm witnesses of the truth of God. Our testimony will survive us. There is a vegetation that grows invincibly under the hand of God. There, where the seed is thrown, the, the tree takes root. There, where the martyr has left his bones and his blood, a church comes forth. 
So he's talking about all the ages of martyrs. It looks like the enemies of church of the church crushed the Catholic Church, and there sprung up Catholic churches to honor the martyrs. That happened all throughout the centuries. So are formed the obstacles that devise unstop these floods. In these times of sterility, we still live from the wheat collected in the catacombs. He's talking about the early martyrs. We are still living off the wheat, that is, the, 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 the strength of the faith of these martyrs. St. Agatha, Lucy, St. Sebastian, and all these martyrs of the first 200 years. And we, learn, we look back to them because our time is very similar. With the United Nations and the One World Religion being established, the laws, anti-Catholic laws, being more and more established. And we learn from St. Agatha and St. Lucy. And this is what Rome is telling to, to Archbishop Follet. Oh, just burn a tiny grain of incense. Religious liberty, well, that's, you know, that's a historical problem. Now, modern, you know, Christ the King in the social reign, you know, don't be too loud about it. Just burn one drop of incense, just a little compromise. Just accept a little bit of the Vatican II. And once you do, you're done. Once you do, you're dead. And that's, that's what's happening. But look at St. Agatha, look at St. Lucy, St. all these saints. They wouldn't, well, they wouldn't burn a timeless grain to the pagan gods. And we must be like that. We must imitate these great saints. So let's turn to the Mother of God, consecrate our temple and our body and soul to the Virgin Mary, and ask her to help us be strong, to keep the faith, never to compromise. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.